looking at uh, unmasking the gods of Babylon, the reason why we want to look at that is because that's what the second angel has to deal with. Uh, the second angel in Revelation chapter 14, of course, it says in verse 8, And there followed <coughs> another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The Babylon of the book of Revelation. Who is that talking about? What does this term encompass? And since the issue is an issue of worship, as we found out in the first angel's message, the question we really need to ask is, who is actually worshipped in Babylon? Or what is actually worshipped in Babylon? And how is that being carried out? A little later in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, there's another angel that comes down that lights the whole earth with his glory and talks about Babylon as well and calls God's people out of Babylon and says there's every kind of false worship that goes on there, even the worship of devils in Babylon. Because this is the issue in the last days. It's the worship of the true God versus the worship of Satan, really, if we were to spell it out. Any false worship or worship of any false gods is worship that goes to who? To the one who desired to be worshipped like God. That is, of course, Lucifer, who became Satan. So in looking at Babylon, we want to look at some parallels in history. The story of Babylon, we're familiar with it. Babylon was actual, an actual place. It's not The first mention of it is not in the book of Revelation. It's an actual city that had a king. We looked at King Nebuchadnezzar earlier. And one day, of course, you know, he had this dream where his spirit was troubled. And in this dream, God revealed to him the image in Daniel chapter 2. We have a record of that. And Daniel came and explained, uh, reminded rather the dream to the king and then explained uh, the dream to him. It was a, a fantastic prophecy of what would transpire. The king was so impressed with what Daniel said, it were told in Daniel 2.47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Nebuchadnezzar was impressed with the God of Daniel. He's a God of gods. But a little later, of course, he, uh, he kind of forgot that, it seems, or uh, something happened because he decided to do something a little different. Daniel 3, 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And of course, everyone was required to worship this image. Interesting, we find the city of Babylon, and there is an issue of worship happening right there in history. And we find again in the book of Revelation, Babylon is mentioned, and the issue also has to do with worship. So we can learn about what's going to happen in the last days. We can understand Revelation better when we look at what happened in Babylon, because there is a parallel there. There is a lesson between the literal and the spiritual. The literal city and what happened there, and the spiritual significance of Babylon today. And in verse 6 here in Daniel 3, and whoso, this was the threat, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So not only was there an issue of worship in Babylon, but failure to worship the gods of Babylon came with a death sentence or a death threat. Correct? So we have Babylon, we have worshipping the gods of Babylon, not the true God, and we have a death sentence attached to it, to anyone who ignores this particular command and instruction. So we want to look at that, because in that story, we know there were three faithful boys, Hebrew young men, and uh, there is a parallel, as we said there, between the literal and the spiritual. Uh, anyone remember the, three na the, bo the names of these three boys? Shadrach, Mishak, and Abednego, yes, we usually know them by their pagan names, right? But the, the, their Hebrew names, anyone remember those? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, there is a very important point and significant fact that they changed their names because their names and their identity signified a loyalty to the true God. In changing their names, they gave them pagan names which indicated a loyalty to the pagan false gods. This has been Satan's attempt all along is to change the identity of God's people and who they worship by changing their gods. He did that to the 
Hebrew boys there in Babylon. And this is what happened, of course. They did not bow down. They were threatened to be thrown in the furnace of fire. I think you all know the story. This is just a highlight revision. Daniel 3.18 says, But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. It was a contest of worship. They decided to remain true and faithful to God and not worship the gods of Babylon. This is what God's true people will do in the last days. They will not worship the gods of Babylon. Babylon is fallen. And actually, the Bible says, become a cage of every unclean bird and the habitation of devils. What is the God that is worshipped in Babylon? The parallels are very clear. Let's just draw them together here. We go back to the book of Revelation in verse 13. And this is what it says. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. This beast power also is associated with Babylon. And we see that this beast power receives power, receives great authority, so much so that it impacts the whole world. The whole world wanders after this beast. And involved in that is also an issue of worship. It says, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So the worship that takes place here, it says, it goes to the dragon. Who is the dragon? The book of Revelation tells us, 12, 9, and the, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. That's why we said earlier, any worship outside of the Father through the Son is worship that is claimed by Satan, Satan the dragon. This is what happens. This is the contest of worship in the last days. The contest is between the true God of the Bible and Satan. And Satan, of course, when he desires to be worshipped through this system of the beast in Babylon, he will not obviously advertise himself as Satan, and this is how he will be worshipped. There is obviously going to be involved some kind of a deception, as this verse tells us. It says he deceives the whole world, and the purpose of this deception is to gain their worship. So there's going to be this deception that has to do with worship, that will result in Satan being worshipped, which will not look like Satan worship. Because to many people, that is so obviously and outrageously wrong, no one's going to fall for that. What is the deception that Satan will use to accomplish worship to him? He does it through this system called the beast. The Bible also refers to it as Babylon. This is what we want to uncover, this is what we want to unmask. And this is the reason why God actually sends a message from heaven saying, Babylon is fallen is fallen and it's repeated twice not only that in Revelation 13 15 we find this as well and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed that's the same thing that happened in ancient Babylon right we have <coughs> Babylon we have an issue of worship and we have a death sentence and this is what we find in the book of Revelation that's why we're going to history to find the parallels and it actually helps us to understand and appreciate what is actually taking place or what will take place in the last days a little later in the book of Revelation it tells us about this great city and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth and this is what the second angel said Babylon is fallen is fallen that great city so this is what we're talking about under, un, under different symbols and representations. God is telling us about the system where there will be false worship in the last days. And this false worship will eventually be enforced with a death sentence. Another name for that is in 1 John 2 and 22. And it says there, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and... The Son, this system, this is probably one of the most common terms that we refer to, is the Antichrist. There's a lot of talk about the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? You know, how can we find out who the Antichrist is? And here's an identifying mark for the Antichrist. It's the same system of false worship that denies the Father and the Son. This is actually the only identifying mark that we find in First John, in the letters of John. What is this system that denies the Father and the Son. How are the Father and the Son denied? 
and we'll see that as well as we go along. But this is the issue of worship. How does this power deny worship? So who is this? <clears throat> The Bible, like we said, uses many different terms to refer to the system that is this interconnected system of false worship. It's called Babylon the Great or the Great Whore. It's the first beast in Revelation 13. It's the little horn in Daniel 7. And it's the Antichrist in 1 John. And they're all talking about the same thing. Who is that? Our study today is not going to be about who that is. We're going to quickly uh, identify that because for more than a thousand years... Bible-believing Christians have believed and identified Rome as this system that is referred to as the Antichrist, Babylon the Great, uh, the whore in Revelation 17. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I want to build on that a little bit uh, because all the reformers, the Protestants, and, and for hundreds of years this was understood clearly by them that the only system that meets all the qualifications in the scriptures that are mentioned in Revelation and many other places, is the system that finds its headquarters there in Rome. Now, this is not to say that the people in that system are aware of that. But we're talking about the system itself. I'll just give you a quote about that, just so, so you see it for yourself. Uh, Wycliffe, Tyndall, Luther, Calvin, Kramer in the 17th century, Bunyan, the translators of the King James Bible and the men who published the Westminster and Baptist Confessions of Faith, Sir Isaac Newton, Wesley, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, and more recently Spurgeon, Bishop J.C. Ryle, and Dr. Martin, Martin Lloyd-Jones. These men, among countless others, all saw the office of the papacy as the Antichrist. It's this system that's going to usher in this false worship. This is what we're talking about. We want to understand and see how this will be accomplished, because as we said, this is... Uh, an age-old belief and understanding of what the scriptures refer to when it talks about the uh, woman, Babylon, the whore, this great city that the second angel warns as it's being fallen. How is it that the dragon is going to use this system to accomplish a deception that will give worship to him? This is really what we want to explore. This is what we want to find out. This is what we... This is why we looked earlier at what the Bible says about true worship and where true worship belongs and who it belongs to. We want to see now the counterfeit or the other side and it will be a very stark contrast as we shall see. A few years ago a prophecy was you know, fulfilled, I don't know if you remember this, but at the funeral of the Pope, when John Paul passed away we had a very interesting situation. For the first time in history you had three American presidents two ex-presidents and one current president at the time who went to the funeral of the Pope. That was a very, very historical moment. Does everyone remember that? Back in 2005? What's that? Ten years ago now. And since then, things have been uh, developing in a very, very interesting manner. Of course, the new Pope who took over Benedict, one of the first things he said was to call for unity. And again, the current Pope after him tells us here, Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals, Catholics. Division is the work of the devil. That's true. Division is the work of the devil. And we need to all be united on the truth as found in the scriptures. And we need to be united in our worship, in what the scripture tells us, who we ought to worship. Anything other than that is a deceptive and false union. And so in this Contest of worship in the last days, Revelation 14, 1, talks about the other group on the other side who do not go along with this particular plan of false worship. It says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is who God's people worship. They worship the Father. We found out earlier that the Father is the only true God, and there is none other but He. And the only way we can worship Him correctly is through the way to the Father, and that is through His only begotten Son. This is who these people worship, signified by the name, and elsewhere it's referred to as the seal of God, the name written in their foreheads. Now, this is not a literal name that is written in the forehead. The forehead, of course, is where your mind is. This is where your decision-making center is. Your understanding is involved in worship. You need to know who you worship. You understand who you worship. This is what it's talking about. And in your mind, in your character, in your, 
in your spirit, you are to reflect the image of who you worship. This is the whole point of worship. We become like what or who we worship. It's a rule. It's a, a formula that cannot be broken. God's true and faithful people, they worship God. They, be, they become in their character, in their mind, in their heart, like God. They're referred to here as 144,000. Interesting what's written on the forehead, because when we go to the other side again, we find there's also something written on the forehead. Revelation 17, 5. It says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. So God's people worship the true God, the Father. His name is in their forehead. In Babylon, we also find a name on her forehead, and it's called Mystery, Babylon the Great. This is in reference also to the God that is worshipped in Babylon. Both are, you know, the forehead, the mind. This is where the battle, this is where the contest is. Who is going to obtain the worship of our minds and of our hearts? Is it going to be the true God or is it going to be the God of Babylon? That's the question and that's the challenge. Well, we need to ask the question, who is this God that is worshipped in Babylon? In other words, what does Rome say that her central God is? <coughs> What is this mystery that is the central doctrine and that is the center of worship in this, uh, for the whore who has this name in our forehead? Now, that's answered in this particular book, among many, Handbook for Today's Catholic. It says, the mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith. Upon it are based all the other teachings of the Church. Well, that's interesting because that's what a lot of people who are not necessarily... Members or who do not necessarily belong to the system will also worship the same thing, the Trinity. So I know this is a bit of a this is a bit of a bold claim here. Someone will say, Well, what are you talking about? The Trinity. That's what everybody believes. The Trinity is in the Bible. You're really mixing things up here, brother, you know. Well, we need to see what is this all about. Why is it that Rome says that the mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith? Every other teaching including Sunday worship, is based on the God that they worship. In this case, it's referred to as Trinity. I find it interesting that the words in Revelation uh, 17.5, it says, Mystery Babylon the Great. That's what's written on the forehead. And Rome says that the central God that they worship is a mystery. It's the mystery of the Trinity. So what is this all about? Mystery Babylon the Great. And like I said earlier, you know, Babylon... Uh, Mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. This system is a mother, is a source that has many daughters. If she's the mother of harlots, she has daughters. The daughters are referred to as harlots. And the daughters have or carry the same characteristics as the mother. Of course, particularly in worship. If you worship the same God as the mother, you have the same identification. That's why she's called mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So... Babylon the Great. We can go back to Babylon. And we go back to Babylon, we find that earlier in Babylon, we know the story of the building of the Tower of Babel. Not long after the flood, we find uh, Nimrod and his uh, companions building this city. And in the city was this Tower of Babel. And of course, God was not pleased about this project. He came down or he sent... Uh, you know, destruction upon that, and he confused the languages. But what was the system of worship in Babylon? It was actually a system of sun worship. Nimrod was married to a woman. This is a little bit of history here. Uh, Nimrod was married to a woman. I guess I have it here in the quote. Uh, well, let's read that, and then I'll give you a little bit of a of background. Uh, here, this is referring to the book, The Two Babylons, by Alexander Hislop. It says, Hislop believes... The religion that began at the Tower of Babel was actually the worship of Satan in the form of fire, the sun, and the serpent. However, Satan worship could not be done openly because of the many who still believed in the true God of Noah. So a mystery religion began at Babel where Satan could be worshipped in secret. This was what ba uh, Babylon, the original city, and uh, Babel was all about. It was a, a system of rebellion against God and the God who brought the flood and said, we want nothing to do with that. And it was a worship of Satan. It was masked and it was couched in different 
uh, ways. It was a mystery religion because it's interesting, the same thing is in the book of Revelation, Mystery Babylon the Great. And this mystery religion was based uh, on the concept of the Trinity. And we'll see why. Because Nimrod, the builder of the Tower of Babel, was married to a woman by the name of Sem Semiramis or Semiramis, however way you pronounce it. And they were seen as in the place of God. And then Nimrod died, and when he died, uh, Semiramis co continued this, uh, this form of worship, and then a little later she became pregnant. And when she became pregnant, she said, uh, you know, and she initially had said that, you know, when Nimrod died, he, he went up to the sun, he became the sun god, and this is how we can continue worshipping Nimrod forever. And, and then she said, it was a ray of the sun that, that came into my belly, and this is how I, came, I became pregnant. And... Uh, Obviously, that's not what happened, but this is what she told the people. This is, this is how this whole system of worship, you know, was couched. And so the child that was born uh, came to be understood to be a reincarnation of Nimrod, the sun god. And the child's name was Tammuz, if, uh, if you're familiar with a little bit of his. Just is a brief history. There's nothing too complicated there. And so Tammuz became a reincarnation of Nimrod, and so all three were worshipped as the sun god, representatives of the sun god. It was sun worship. It was actually the very first concept of a three-in-one that we know of in history. It originated in ba Babylon, at the Tower of Babel. And this concept, when God confused the languages, when God stopped the building project and confused the languages and all the different cultures and all the different people traveled to different places, the same concept traveled with them in the different languages and in the different cultures. This is why we find in many places, strangely enough, this common denominator that links everything back to Babylon, particularly as to who is worshipped. And of course, as we said, this is sun worship or Satan worship. So in Babylon, it was Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis. In Egypt, it was Osiris, Horus, and Isis, or Ra. In uh, Greece, it was Zeus, Apollo, Athena. In India, it was Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. In Rome, it was Jupiter, Mars, and Venus, and so on and so forth. It's a long list. This is a sample. If you look at all the different cultures, particularly the cultures that did not subscribe to the belief of the true God, as the Bible reveals it, we find this common denominator. Why did they all have three in their worship? Because they all, at one point, were together in Babylon. And this was the religion that began in Babylon. And so the earliest origin of this concept of the three-in-one is this concept of sun worship. Let's look at another example here in history just to verify that. In, uh, this is in the New International Encyclopedia. This is what it says. Three, that's the number three. Three became the most universal number of deity. Sun worship is one of the most primitive forms of religion and early man sometimes distinguished between rising, midday, and setting sun. The Egyptians, for example, divided the sun god into three deities. Horus at the rising sun, Ra at the midday sun, and Osiris, which is the old and the setting sun. And you see that in the images and in the pictures. Uh, you see these little circles on their heads? What do these circles represent, do you think? The sun. The sun god. This is who is worshipped. And they had these three stages of the sun. So when they looked at the sun, they saw that the sun is sunrise, uh, midday, and sunset. It was a very fitting Three in one. It's the same sun, but there's three different phases or three different manifestations, but it's the same sun. So there's three in one concept. And this is ha how the worship of Satan was actually hidden and masked in this mystery religion. The three in one <laughs> concept. The three in one concept is not biblical. This is a, here's a news flash. It, this is actually where it comes from. And like uh, it has traveled in many cultures, actually infiltrated the Christian culture or the Christian uh, belief. And so these are the three stages of the sun. And then, of course, they would further, uh, you know, mask this, uh, this, these ideas in different forms and pictures. We already saw some pictures. Uh, and so if the three are one, so the three make up only one. And so you have this interesting symbol which is a symbol of the sun god or sun worship, these three interlocking circles to make one particular shape. Of course, this shape is a very fitting uh, triangle. An equilateral triangle also came to represent the three-in-one sun god, a triangle with three equal parts. History, of course, tells us that as well in, in the same book, uh, The Two Babylons, 
Has anyone, has anyone read this book or has this book or seen this book? A very, very interesting historical <coughs> documentation. I, I highly recommend this book. It's, it's heavy reading, so, you know, get ready. But it's good to do that from time to time to get the mind uh, going. Anyway, so this is uh, from that particular book. It says here, In the unity of that one only God of the Babylonians, there were three persons, and to symbolize that doctrine of the Trinity, they employed, as the discoveries of Layard prove, the equilateral triangle, just as it is well known the Romish church does at this day. So he's saying, basically, this religion that began at Babylon was a religion of three persons making up one God, and they used symbols to signify that. One of the symbols is this equilateral triangle to represent this trinity. Equilateral because each side is obviously equal. Three making up one. That's the origin of that. And so when we look at an equilateral triangle, interestingly enough, you find that the angles of an equilateral triangle is 60 degrees in each corner. If you, did, uh, if you did that in school, when you studied that, if you remember when you go measure the angles, this is what an equilateral triangle, the angles of it, no matter how big or small, right? Same thing. And so this became a very uh, fitting symbol. Sorry, this became a very fitting number for that symbol, 666. This is where 666 comes from, actually. And a whole variety of other uh, ways where there are numbers and ways that 666 became a number to symbolize and represent sun worship. And when I say 666, it will be a totally irrelevant number, except that it happens to be mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, that has to do with the system of false worship. It was sun worship. The, the religion of 666. So you could draw a picture to represent that. You could write a number. And those who understood the significance of the number, they would under, understand what the number represented. And so this is how this religion was hidden in pictures, in symbols, and in numbers. And we see that in ancient cultures. Here is a very interesting stone from Babylon where you see a worshiper, and there is a triangle, and up the top there is the sun god. This is how this was represented and conveyed. And of course, this found itself, uh, its way all the way to, to Egypt, where you find some of the biggest triangles, well, pyramids there, of course, but that's this triangular shape. It is the system of sun worship, the worship of the sun. Again, this uh, symbol is modified here, just to look at it, because we find it very interesting when you trace the origin of these things. These three phases of the sun god, these three interlocking uh, circles, makes the symbol that today is called a triketra. Okay, triketra, three interlocking discs or circles, and this is how it's represented. And so if you uh, <coughs> take the interlocking part, you know, part to represent the whole and, and clean it all up and make it nice and neat, uh, three in one. Three circles, but one, the three in one God. This symbol is actually very common, not only in pagan culture, but it's also very common today as well. And there's a variety of ways you can be quite artistic about that as to how you can draw, but all essentially is the same thing. It's this three in one, one in three. Has anyone seen the symbol before? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's quite common. We'll see where it is now in a minute. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite common. This is what it's called. This is where it comes from. It's this concept of the three in one. It's, it's really sun worship. It's the image for sun worship or the sun god. Uh, Here is one place where you see this image. This is a uh, Wiccan full-size chalices and goblets that you can buy. Uh, witchcraft today, modern witchcraft. You can go online and buy that. Uh, what's the symbol there on the cup or the chalice? It's a triketra. Now, it's not surprising to see there because these guys, you know, they, they have nothing to do with the Bible. They worship, really, witchcraft is really Satan worship. It is ancient Babylonian mysticism that comes all the way from Babylon, still alive and well today. And so it's not surprising to see that there. Here's, <clears throat> here's another example. This is a robe, or, you know, uh, this is their, their, their wear, their, their uh, uniform, I guess. But here's what Harper's Encyclopedia says. It says, Symbols are important to all esoteric teachings, for they contain secret wisdom accessible only to the initiated. So you might look at this picture and think, well, that's a cute little symbol. But hopefully now you understand, well, where does it come from, what it actually represents. This is why 
these symbols are worn everywhere. And of course, again, you see there is, there is a worshiper with the hands open, just like the one we saw where? In Babylon, right? And there is the sun worship image, the triketra, the three in one and one in three. It's, uh, it's in a lot of places. Here is, uh, this is from the TV show Charm. This was a few years ago. Anyone remember that? No? Great. No problem. That's excellent. I hope no one was watching it. Anyway, it's a show about three witches, right? And this is what the, the Book of Shadows in the show was. Uh, it had this symbol on it. So it's a very common and popular symbol. Here's another one. This is uh, the Aquarian comp- uh, Conspiracy. Same symbol. Uh, the Craft. A Witch's Book of Shadows. Same symbol. And so you see a common thread here. That this system of worship that started in Babylon is still alive and is still well. And it's not surprising to see it alive and well in such circles. In witchcraft, maybe in entertainment, in the media. It's not, that's not very Christian. So it's not surprising. Satan is doing something. But Satan's goal is to really deceive not just a group of people, but to deceive the whole world. So that would include also Christians. And we're going to see that it actually comes a lot closer to home. So this system of Babylon uh, that started in Babylon, the system of ancient sun worship, came down through all the different cultures all the way to our day. In Assyria, for example, just go back in history there again for a minute, we find the same thing. That round disc there up the top, and there are three represented there. That's the worship of three-in-one sun worship. The three-in-one sun god. Travel to different cultures, as we said, in India, you find India Hinduism and Buddhism. And you find there, interestingly enough, these uh, idols or these representations, a three-faced god uh, in many, many different places. You've seen some of this, right? You know, we're, one time we were in Fiji, in Fiji there are a lot of Indians there, uh, and they're Hindu. And, uh, and they were sitting and, and were sharing this, and they were very, very surprised, because there's no explanation why there's three. But you find that there is common denominators and it all comes back. It started all in Babylon. This is what it's all about. These are the different forms that this system of sun worship took in the different cultures. Of course, in these systems, it took on different names according to the language. But it was the same concept. I want you to keep this point in mind. The same concept traveled but took on different names relevant to the culture that continued that particular concept. And there's many of that. This is uh, some more examples. And uh, again, three and overshadowed by one. Here it is three with the, with the sacred uh, halo behind the head there. That means it is holy, right? No, that's a symbol of the sun god. This is sun worship. Symbolizing. Not everybody who's involved in this is well aware of that. So I, I'm talking about the systems of worship. I'm not making a blanket condemnation here of everyone who is doing this. A lot of people do this very sincerely, very honestly, unaware of the origins where it comes from. And of course, again, in Egypt we see that a number of places. Here it is uh, in all the different <coughs> paintings and, and, uh, and statues there. This is the system of sun worship. This is why we find in the scriptures, when God instructed the Israelites to go into the promised land, we find this very interesting verse in Numbers 33 and verse 52. He says, Then he shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images and quite pluck down all their high places. Why do you think God told them that? Because it, it says pictures there in the Bible. You can open up and find it. You know, when I, when I saw this verse, I'm like, wow, nobody talked about this verse. They had to destroy all their pictures and all their images. Because in the pictures and the images was contained all the symbols for this sun worship or devil worship. God says, when, you, when my people go in there, I want you to get rid of all that stuff. This is not how you worship me. This is the false counterfeit system of worship. And they were instructed to do so. So the presence of the, of the picture is not... You know, having a picture is not the problem in and of itself. The, pri- the picture is symbolic of what it stands for. It's the concept and the idea of worship behind that. Now, like I said, this, uh, this picture is a lot closer to home, this, this triketra. You also find it on this book called the New King James Version, which is the Holy Bible. Anyone got a New King James here? Okay, yeah? No, no one wants to volunteer that information now. Uh, it's... Uh, if you've got a New King James Bible, you're going to have this symbol either on the spine or right in the, in the front. And, and if you open up, you know, in the front, it'll tell you, this is the ancient symbol for the Trinity. 
It doesn't really tell you where it comes from or anything like that. It's just an ancient symbol for the Trinity. And this concept, brothers and sisters, has now been adopted into the Christian culture and has taken on Christian names, even biblical names. But the concept itself is non-existent in the scriptures. It's the concept of the three in one, one in three God that comes all the way from Babylon. Now, I know this is a very alarming claim, but we're just tracing it together in history. And we saw what the Bible says when it comes to God. God is never presented in the scriptures as a three-in-one God. The God of the Bible is only one being. And we found out that there is God the Father and none other but He. And of course, He has a Son and He has a Spirit. But that, those terms have been taken and now they've been applied to a concept that is foreign to the scripture. And so when we talk about Father, Son, and Spirit, people immediately say, oh, well, isn't that the Trinity? Well, there is a right way to understand it, a biblical way, and there is a wrong way to understand it. And this is what a deception is all about. We're trying to unmask a deception here. So this, it's going to look like the real thing in some parts. So I just want us to, to be clear on that. This is in a lot of places. Here is another example of that. Uh, this is a beautiful stained glass window in a, in a beautiful church. And do you see anything interesting there? Okay, there it is, the outline of, of the Trinity. Why is that shaking? Oh, is the train, is there? Okay. All right, well, that's, that's the train. Thank you. All right, here is another one. See anything interesting there? Up the, in the top window is actually the three interlocking circles. Now, there's plenty of symbols, and they have a lot of me. I'm just focusing on this one. Now, how many worshipers who go into this church to worship how many of them do you think understand the meaning and the origin of this symbol? Most of them don't have a clue. And we, once you understand it, you see, hold on a minute. This is, this is now, this means this concept, not just the picture. This concept actually is part of the Christian faith. It's part of our worship. It becomes very, very alarming. There's many examples of that. I'm giving you more because... I don't want us to think this is just some isolated case, some obscure church somewhere. This is all over the place. Here is the cathedral church of the Holy Trinity. That's what the window looks like from the inside and from the outside. And there is the triangle, Holy Trinity Cathedral. What is this? This is the three-in-one God. A lot of people think this is the Christian God and that this is found in the scriptures. It is not. This comes from Babylon. It just has Christian names, Christian labels, but the concept comes from Babylon and it affects the worship. Here's another one. This is on the pews of, of St. Andrew's, Andrew's Presbyterian Church this time. So it's not just in one church. A lot of churches. Uh, at the end of the pews there, here is the interesting symbol. How many people who sit on that pew have an idea of what that represents? Probably hardly anyone. And so remember, we said earlier that Babylon is a mother that has daughters. She's a mother of harlots. We find that in all these churches, the same idea exists that comes all the way from the original Babylon. Here's another interesting picture. This is full of symbols. The one on the right here is supposed to be God the Father. The one on the left is supposed to be God uh, the Son in this trinity. And there is the the spirit there. Christian, some Christian concepts now, but mixed in with, with pagan concepts. What, why does God the Father have a triangle behind his head? What does that represent? Do you find that in the Bible? No way. That, that is the sun worship. Now it is couched and masked in Christian symbols and Christian language. And so as Christians, rather than checking the scriptures, it's swallowed and it's become Christian tradition. It's so entrenched that if anyone starts to speak about it, and say, hold on, this might not be right. It is so deeply entrenched that it sounds crazy to even suggest that. And Christ has this, this halo around his head. Why, where do we read about that in the Bible? Nowhere. And, and there is the sun there clearly in the background with the sun rays, so you don't mistake it at all. And it's all in one nice big circle, three in one, one in three. Now, if you look at this, you think this is nice art if you don't understand the symbols. But once you understand their origin, what they mean, all of a sudden, the picture takes on a whole different meaning. Isn't that right? It actually becomes extremely alarming. Here's a Catholic church or a cathedral. And uh, I don't know if you can see that. It's a bit dark. I'm sorry. But can you see that a little bit there? I've just enlarged it. That's the window up the top. Again, same thing. The three in one. And the uh, 
statue up the top there is supposed to be a statue of who? Jesus, right? I don't need to, they don't need to put a name under it. Everybody knows that's supposed to be Jesus, of course. That's who's worshipped here. But there's also right there at the entrance, for those who will understand, this is how the sun worship, brothers and sisters, has been masked and has actually infiltrated Christianity. And it's in the concept that is behind this picture. I'm not saying just because the picture is there, everybody knows what they're doing. But the concept exists in people's minds. The concept of God being three in one and one in three. This is where the battle of worship is because the name is written on the forehead. Here's another one. This is a window from the outside. Uh, and here is what it looks like from the inside. I really love glass stained windows so I can go in with my camera. And, and so it's really beautiful. But again, you have the three interlocking circles. And this is in the keys. This is the, the, the mitre, the, the crown of of the Pope, of course. So this concept does exist, it's still alive and well today, but it should not be in the church which professes to worship the God of the Bible. This is not a symbol of the God of the Bible. This is the God of Babylon. So, here's what we read from the Catholic Catechism. Question and answer. We talked about that earlier. Has God any body? Does He have a body? No, God has no body. He is pure spirit. Does the Bible teach that? So it doesn't. But that's what a lot of people believe. Maybe you believe that too. But the scripture does not say that. God is revealed as he is a real tangible being. Anyway, let's go on. Are there more gods than one? The answer, no, there is but one God. Are there more persons than one in God? Answer, yes, in God there are three persons. Which are they? Answer, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Question, are there not three gods? Answer, no. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all but one and the same God. Here is this concept. That's exactly the same thing. The three in one and one in three. The three make up one. And the one is actually made up of three. This concept comes all the way from Babylon. The only way you can maintain this concept is if God is pure spirit. That's why it's, a, it's an idea. God to many people is not a real tangible being. Because how can you have three individuals all in one? That's why you have to remove the physical component of God, which the scripture reveals, and say God is only spirit. And that way you can have this strange mystical union of three in one and one in three, which cannot be understood by anyone. And yet is a required belief and forms part of worship. And this is what the Athanasian Creed says from the New Catechism. Now, this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in the Trinity and the Trinity in unity without either confusing the persons or dividing the substance. For the person of the Father is one, the Son is another, the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. It sounds very true. It sounds very right, because it has some Bible <coughs> names and terms thrown in there. But the concept is foreign to the Scripture. See what we're saying? Now, this is not just the creed of the, of, the, of the Catholic Church. This is the creed of a lot of churches, Protestant churches, evangelical churches, and many, many others. This is who is worshipped. This is exactly what comes from ancient Babylon. Here is a symbol. Today you'll find this is a very common symbol of the Trinity. On the left there, this is from a Catholic book. Again, it's represented as a triangle and circles. And God is in the middle. There is one God, but it's the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and the Son. And the Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is this other entity, this other person. He's not the Father, he's not the Son. The scripture we saw very clearly, we read it earlier. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.17, Now the Lord, that is Jesus, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You see, separating the Spirit from God and His Son and making it into another person allows Satan to continue that deception and affect people's worship. And it uh, comes all the way from Babylon. And they all worship the same God. Here is a, a Christian book now called The Trinity. Rediscovering the Central Christian Mystery. And what do we see there uh, on the cover? Three... It's supposed to be, I guess, Father, Son, and Spirit, and three discs, the round discs of the Son. Where did we see that earlier? In Hinduism. 
you would see this and you think this is pagan culture we don't believe that as Christians but this is Christian now you just take it and put some Christian imagery Christian names same concept different names and that's how you pass off a, a deception it's very alarming brothers and sisters because this affects the worship of people who go to church with their Bible in their hand and yet in their mind is a concept that comes from Babylon not from the Bible we have a very serious situation on our hands in the last days that's why the angel talks about fearing God giving glory to him and worshiping him Here's uh, another one. Here's Jesus with the halo. And there's many, okay? We could, we, could, <laughs> we could go for hours looking at pictures. I'm just picking a sample here just to see that this is something that is alarming. And it is there. Here's another book, The Forgotten Trinity, Rediscovering the Heart of Christian Belief. What's the symbol on the book? The symbol of the sun god. That's the triketra. The symbol of the sun god that comes from Babylon. The symbol of the trinity. So, you know, here's, yeah, here's another uh, article. This is another interesting one. Uh, fundamental beliefs. Belief number two. One plus one plus one equals one. And this is called the keystone of biblical theology. Now, if you did this in math in, in school, you would have gotten a big F. You got a fail. Correct? Now, it's, it's, I know it sounds a little funny, but think about it. This is not acceptable in school in math. In the infinitely more important area of our religion, of our spirituality, of our connection with God, of our worship to God, we are ready to accept things that we would not accept in everyday life. If you borrowed money from the bank, you borrowed, borrowed 100,000, uh, sorry, you borrowed 300,000, and you're going to want to give it back as 100,000, and the bank's not going to accept that, right? You say, well, my pastor says, you know, that three is one and one is three is three. So you can take one and that will be like three. You know, they, they might arrest you or put you in jail. Or, that, that's total nonsense. You with me? But when it comes to our actual faith, the worship that we give to God, we are ready to accept such outrageously nonsense ideas and not examine them, not look at them, not question them. Or if we question them, we say, oh, there's something wrong with this brother or this sister. You know, be careful because... They're actually questioning this sacred concept. Such is the success of the devil's deception, brothers and sisters. And here it is right there. You know, one, one, one. And there's a nice bright sun in the background. And who can understand what's hidden in the pictures, right? We have a very, very serious problem on our hands, brothers and sisters. That's why we examined what the Bible has to say. Now we're looking at the origin of this idea, of this concept of three and one and one and three. It has no place in the scriptures. It actually comes all the way from ancient Babylon. And so this is another book. This book is called The Trinity as well. And on the cover of the book, we have the same image, the same triketra. And this book says it's about understanding God's love, His plan of salvation, and Christian relationships. Sounds fantastic and sounds beautiful. But from the cover, if you know and to understand the meanings and the symbols, is the picture of the sun god. The Trinity is the name of the sun god today. That's, that's who is worshipped. That's alarming. Interesting enough, this book is, is written by three authors. Uh, this is from Andrews University, by the way, for those of you who are familiar with that. Uh, three authors for the book. I don't know if this is coincidence or what, but maybe if they use three authors, it, it just might work, right? And there it is all in color for us, the triketra with the discs, the burning discs of the three-in-one sun god. The Bible says, by the sisters, that the whole world wanders after the beast. And the purpose of that is worship. And that worship will ultimately go to the dragon. That's a very serious and alarming claim, I know. But according to the scriptures, any worship outside the Father and the Son is claimed by the one who desired worship. That is Satan. That's why the Bible makes it very clear who, are, who we are to worship, and it stops there and actually tells us that in the last days there's going to be a message to restore to people the correct understanding of who they are to worship. There are many honest people who don't know some of these things that we're sharing today, who are worshiping God ignorantly. Sincerely, but 
Ignorantly, this is why there's something called the three angels' messages that has to do with worship. So that people know who they worship, they know that who, who the true God is, and they worship Him correctly, and they have His name in their foreheads. Remember when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, and she asked Him a question of worship. And He told her something very interesting. This is in John 4, you can read it later in your own time. And He told her, You know not who you worship. We know who we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. So did Jesus approve of worshipping things you don't understand? No. He told her, you don't know who you worship. Today it is freely admitted, brothers and sisters, that the Trinity is a mystery that no one understands. And yet you are required to believe it and to worship it. As a matter of fact, it is one of the markers for identifying any deviant uh, Christian group, so to speak. What I, what I mean is this. People say, if you want to find a cult or, or, or a group that's not really Christian, first marker, do they believe in the Trinity? If not, then they're not really Christian. This is how deeply entrenched this tradition has become. It's become the testing truth. And so when we talk about unity and all the world wandering after the beast and all the Christians uniting, what's the purpose of this unity? According to prophecy in the book of Revelation, it is a unity that's to bring about a worship of the same thing. That is not the worship of the true God. The true God is not worshipped in Babylon. The sun God is worshipped in Babylon. So this is a question that I want to close with here today. Who will you worship? Will it be the sun God? Or will it be the true God? It's a decision we have to make. Each and every one has to make. Because this is what the contest is all about, brothers and sisters. And... Uh, Hopefully it makes sense in light of what we saw in the scriptures before. Now we see the contrast. And uh, as we go a little, longer, uh, a little more, we hopefully it will get a little cre clearer. But does it make sense so far? I just want to make sure. It's, you understand what we're talking about? Okay, it's important to understand because that's what we pray for. I just want to make sure that I'm clear in what I'm saying. And uh, like I said, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to address any questions. But it's something to really pray about, brothers and sisters. The issue of worship in the last days is the issue that will decide our salvation or damnation. Who do you worship? It's not just when do you worship, but it is who you worship. You might have the right day, but if you have the wrong God, you're still on the wrong side. You realize that? Having the right day is not good enough. You need to have the right God. The God of the Sabbath is the true God. It's not the sun God. The sun God has his own day. It's called the sun day. That's, where, that's when the sun God is worshipped. That's where Sunday worship actually comes from. It comes from the same place, Babylon. I didn't go into too much detail because I think that's a little bit more known, perhaps. But the origin of that worship is in Babylon. It's the God of Sunday that is the, the key issue. You know, Sunday worship. There are a lot of people who... Worship the true God on Sunday. You realize that? They don't believe in the Trinity, but they just worship on Sunday. And if they're open to God's leading, the Lord will bring them to the truth of when is the right day to worship, which is the Sabbath. The scripture says that very plainly. But the question is not just which day. Many times, especially uh, those of us who might keep the seventh day Sabbath, we believe we've got it all right because we have the right day and these poor people over there, they have the wrong day. Well, guess what? The right day and the wrong day does, is totally irrelevant if you don't have the right God. That is infinitely more important. And even today among us, if we keep the Sabbath, we find that the presence of the sun God is a very alarming thing. A lot of people say, well, you know, Sunday is the issue. I'll never give in to Sunday. But what if you're already worshipping the sun God on Sabbath? Then are you really a Sabbath keeper? No. You might be keeping Saturday, but your loyalty and allegiance in your mind is actually going to the sun God. That's a very, very dangerous situation to consider. So brothers and sisters, we're in very, very serious times. So I just pray that you will uh, not just understand what is being said, but really take it to heart because the issue of worship is really what it's all about in these last days. Let's have a word of prayer to close and then we'll, uh, we'll pray for lunch.